This is Adam from Asset Horizon, and today me and my good comrade Kyle from Profane Illuminations are joined by the legendary music critic and writer of the new editions of the word, Simon Reynolds, a writer who needs no introduction but deserves one anyway. But from years in the blogosphere to publishing pieces and pretty much everywhere that talks about music, to books covering particularly dense and vast histories of post-punk, rave, hip-hop, glam, and my personal favourite of Jungle. Simon's work can be characterised by a series of significant culminations that include, of course, 1998's colossal Energy Flash, a journey through rave music and dance culture, and Retromania, a reflection on the commemoratory and nostalgic tendencies of contemporary music. So Retromania is a work that's very much in a direct conversation with Ghosts of My Life. Evident, of course, in numerous ways that Mark and Simon's work spoke to each other, both directly and indirectly. And of course, as I'm sure we'll cover today, in many ways that persist into the present day and into the present discourse of culture and politics in the current conjecture. Simon and Mark's work quite poetically reminds us that the marriage of critical theory and music criticism gives body to new means of cultural investigation. Most significantly, by arching into our contemporary moment through both the capturing of an era and the enduring relevance of critique to those eras. My hope for today is that we might in some way do justice to this very spirit of cultural inquiry. Simon, thanks so much for coming on to the show. Oh, my pleasure. So just to get into sort of the origins of Ghosts of My Life, and just I always talk about the general sort of scene in which this came about, because this, in many ways was the product of a load of blog posts from Mark K. Plunk blog, but also very much taps into the idea he draws upon of a senius, a collective oh. knowledge production on various and on message boards and blogs, of which he was self very much a part. So I wanted to ask you something about what were the conditions that led up to this book's arrival on the, on the scene? Well, I think some somewhere along the line, probably right from the start of doing the blogs, this sort of critique of retro culture emerged jointly, simultaneously, on K-Punk, my blog, this blog, other blogs chipped in as well. The similar kind of, I mean, I had Owen, Owen Hathaway writing about modernism, 20th century modernism in architecture, which is sort of related to the idea of a lost future, a lost modernism. So a lot of the people who would be the Zero Books crew and the Repeater Books crew were blogging and in this collective conversation, Mark and I were particularly active on it. Then we started talking about ontology. So it was really kind of like a back and forth. And a lot of the contents of Ghosts of My Life is blog posts from k Punk sort of reworked. And same with my book, Retromania, which came out a few years before Ghosts. Quite a bit of blogging informs the actual textual body of it, as well as writings that I've done for The Wire on Ghost Box and ontology and things like that. So, and magazines like Free. So, you know, we were kind of doing the same MO. His book is more like a collection, whereas with Retromania, I did actual research. I kind of was kind of investigating and not entirely sure what I'd end up with when I started it. But uh, yeah, they're kind of like sibling books, I think, in a lot of ways. Even down to the sort of, I think it's a three-year difference between when Retromania came out and Ghost of My Life. And that's almost like the age difference between us. I was five years older than Mark. So yeah, it's very much like a sort of comradely relationship. That's also a little bit of a race on there. It was a bit of a, I was a, I had a sense <laughs> when I was doing it, uh, I should do this, you know, yeah, because Mark's going to do, probably going to uh, fend in with his own take on this area. But yeah, it was very much like a conversation going on between the two of us and the other people as well. It was quite a sort of neighborhood of people who had the same outlook, informed by the same musical surges, post-punk, rave, particularly jungle, where these were these sort of hallowed moments of musical modernism. And then you have this depressive phase of the 2000s when everything seems to be bound up in reference and reverence towards musical eras. So we were grab other, but the thing is other people were talking about like Molus had a really interesting blog and he would come up with all these stuff to do with, I think he talked about retro and crow culture. Mm -hmm. And that was him riffing off an idea that Peter York had actually come up with in the seventies, this great social pop culture, youth culture observer, Peter York. But uh, Momus was doing this great, you found this critique popping up all over the place in newspapers as well. It's not like this is some loopy set of ideas that me and Mark developed on our own. We were responding to what was going on in the culture and you had it in 
there were like all this discourse of ghosts and ruins and the ruins of modernism. You had it in the art world, you had it with reenactments of things, restagings of legendary exhibitions of modernist art. It was pretty culture wide. It wasn't just some crazy perspective cooked up on the blog scene. I mean, abs absolutely, especially after, the, especially in terms of the context of the wider blogosphere, where it emerged from, particularly in the, the crowd adjacent to CCRU, there's this incredible sort of wave of futurism, this meth fueled mania of, of technological oh. acceleration. Then you have this Blairite crash where, uh, where, where culture seems to be smoldering in the Millennium Dome, so to speak. And I, I think that very much comes through this, this work in particular, the melancholy of it and the general sense, it, absolutely, yes, that this ontology is always thought of now as a Fisherian concept, but it's, it's not in the sense of being you know, more of a vibe, but it is a pervasive atmosphere. And there's that tension, I think, you bring up in the afterword very much between sort of a, you know, Mark as a thought leader versus as a, a sort of a, a conduit of a collectivity. And of course, this very much channels into acid communism, where he considers that idea of being an institute yeah. and kind of teaching, well, you know, as a teacher rather than a simple as a, a blogging collectivity. You know, I mean, Mark was very into this whole idea of the importance of theory and of writers generating concepts that actually change things. But there's another sense in which both of us were just responding to what the musicians were already doing and already theorizing for their music. I mean, all these people arrived independently in the same sort of area, Ghost Box Label, Modern Music, The Caretaker. Before that, you had Boards of Canada, Broadcast. I don't know, there was William Brzezinski, there's so many people. They, none of these people knew each other. They all independently came up with this similar aesthetic preoccupations, similar procedures, similar use of technology, and a similar kind of harking back to the lost futures of electronic music. It could have been called something else, like someone, there were other names floated, actually. There was a good name, this writer, Patrick McNally, came up with this word memorabilia, which I rather liked. But for whatever reasons, we went with the... Deridian ontology, <laughs> for better or worse. <clears throat> and I don't think many musicians liked it at all, but that, that was the term, but there could have been another term because there was a reference, there, there was an actual existing sensibility, a kind of structure of feeling that had emerged independently with all these musicians. And you got it in, you started to get it creeping into film and, and uh, art and all kinds of other areas. I don't know if there have been any ontological novels are there yeah but uh, there might be or there might be precursors to it many of the cyberpunk novels i would say would definitely seem relatively hauntological now because they at least many of them at least promised a, a cyberpunk future of capitalist domination but not one that was as incompetent as what we have now the cyberpunk <laughs> at least right. giving you some well, transhuman limit experience <laughs> you can say steampunk which is sort of extension of cyberpunk mm -hmm. or parallel development out of it that has a lot of hauntological sort of vibes to it. In fact, I was looking at this press release for Mark's first, his group Degeneration that I actually wrote really? about without realizing it was Mark back in the nineties. And they used the word steampunk in their press release. So, which has lots of, this is the mid nineties, it had lots of other prefigurings of, of K-punk obsessions and the word ghost appears. And uh, there's, I don't know if there's references to MR James, but to that kind of writing references mm. to Quatum, all these things that would be consecrated in the 2000s as the K-Punkian aesthetic are already there in this sort of 90s. They're assembling themselves in this 90s project that Mark did called Degeneration. Even the title of their EP, Entropy in the UK, mm. it's just so perfectly um, has the echo of punk, but it also has this sense of everything disintegrating and reaching this inertial standstill culturally and the great refusal to the great diffusion i mean i think folks on music particularly i think one of my favorite things what you bring up in your afterward is the idea of memory and how we look back upon this work it's like some parts of this book by mark are gifts some of them are memory loops in the same way that he would talk about the stone tape in weird and eerie simply things that don't directly communicate to you and sometimes he still thinks well it still comes across as if he's talking to us about our contemporary cultural landscape and one of the main artists that really uh, delivers this is the caretaker. I know Kyle, you wanted to talk a lot about the caretaker and about memory and how that functions in Fisher's analysis here. Sure. Yeah. So I th was revisiting the caretaker project in anticipation of our conversation today, a project I'm also, I'm quite fond of. I actually have a quotation. I've brought a passage in the, in Mark's liner notes for a theoretically pure 
anterograde amnesia. This is a passage from that, which is included in a Ghost of My Life. Where were we? You suppose that you could be in familiar territory. It's difficult to know if you've heard this before or not. There's not much to go on, a few landmarks. The tracks have numbers, not names. You can listen to them in any order. The point is to get lost. That's easy in this ill-seen late Beckett landscape. You extemporize stories they call a confabulation to make sense of the abstract shapes looming in the smoke and fog. So, I mean, that, that entire, those entire liner notes are brilliant, but I think most interesting about interrograde amnesia is how as a process is characterized by these series of awakenings in which those affected will, in the case of interrograde amnesia, can potentially log their daily waking up over and over again. A process that is is concurrent, but each sort of each waking up becomes more new than the last, so to speak. Despite this sort of excess of familiarity, you have a diary in which your handwriting logs your waking up of that day, but you have no actual memory of having written it. It just reminds us that memory is driven by a kind of melancholy that we've already brought up. It persists past stages of grief and mourning and involves us in a new space of time, which I think is what's so effective about the project of the caretaker in general. And I think like the work of caretaker, Ghost of My Life, as well as your work, Simon, addresses the sort of indelible qualities of memory, how its tendencies towards disintegration, fragmentation as a specific force. I guess my question is that sort of despite all of this, there's, a, there's an arc of hope that exists within Mark's work within Ghosts of My Life, and now also within this new edition between Matt Calhoun's very lovely prologue and Simon, your afterword. I guess my question would be, if we're considering melancholy and its relationship to memory and perhaps popular modernism, a concept that Mark talks about frequently, what do we make of the potential ways in which music and memory could perhaps service some imperative. You outlined it nicely in your afterword. In one place, you talked about Mark's commitment to the ideal of the collective, and p- perhaps as a working through of self-doubt. And in another place, you described it at the very end as the imperative to dream a new reality. In music, are, is there any hope in this melancholy? Does hauntology relate to our contemporary moment, perhaps, through this sort of potential hopes and melancholy? Or I don't know if you have any thoughts. I don't know. I think how ontology as a as a musical genre, I think maybe as as has has kind of been and gone. I don't know. At the same time, I was surprised how much talk there has been in the in recent years about ideas to do with retro and revivalism I and mean, people seem to be anxious about it again in a way they haven't since really the period in which Ghost of My Life first came out and Retromania and that sort of very intense, what's gone wrong kind of discourse. Why is popular culture going through these endless cycles of repetition? There seems to be a renewed interest or anxiety about it. I lost count of the number of articles I've read recently that have been about identifying, I don't know, early 2000s nostalgia or the continuing 90s nostalgia. So there's been a lot of articles about the fact that it's discovered that streaming an enormous proportion of Tracks that people stream are actually catalog tracks. That's so it's like old music. So old music is defeating the new. So I don't know if there's anywhere musically at the moment that uh, I would say this sort of ontological current is particularly noticeable. There's ontology, the genre as such, has kind of solidified itself and, and carries on. But it feels like that feel, certain artists of that phase are still doing it interesting work like Burial came up with a really great record this year. I guess the caretaker kind of a few years ago had this culminatory grand statement, this six hour, and finished a six hour long last word really on, on memory and the decay of memory. But I don't know, who do you think is still carrying on a ontological viable preoccupations? In music. As Adam and I have discussed, we're part of the, you don't want to be caught in a sort of a state of pet- perpetual concern with the state of popular culture. There's a lot of great stuff to see out there and stuff that we speak very passionately about. 
but in the sort of you negative have, term. You have a lit, lit GT show, though, is, is that right? Or... I, uh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> is that an area of music you think is still coming up with? Well, sure. Well. Yeah. So there's, there's the, yeah, I would think actually, if I could just a plain answer, the first thing that comes to my mind, the most recent Lingua Ignota album, which has moved away from the sort of industrial noise influence to take a turn toward folk music. But what I found so remarkable about the album's called Sinners Get Ready, for those who haven't heard it, what I found most interesting and provocative about that language is the unapologetic sort of reclaiming of past phenomena while still presenting. There's a simultaneous critique that runs as a current that, you know, metal does very well appropriating the aesthetics of like, we'd use a very basic example, appropriating the aesthetics of religious culture and inverting it as a sort of transgressive means. But in this case, it's so much, lingua ignota is so much less, the, the criticism isn't, it's not a vacuum of criticism, right? It is through sort of the negativity that it's trying to build bonds and create some something that's at least sonically referencing the familiar without approaching that sort of like perpetual present and getting swallowed by the image. The image has depth. Something that I've, I've, I've read you, I've seen, I've either seen you speak or just read your writing in the past that there's a very important dimension, per, there's a very important human and personal dimension in music that often gets lost by us trying to chase the absolute, this is the state of culture. This is the sort of sonic state of culture rather yeah. than remembering that dance music, for example, was created in oftentimes these sort of like guerrilla formed spaces with actual people who are experiencing actual things. Um, right. And I know that gets harder in our contemporary moment as we are more restrained. In sort of the, spa the spatial element, I guess, if that can be relayed sonically, I think that would be, that's beneficial. Well, maybe just Adam. to bring in a conceptual, just to, to, to inject a, a dose of theory, just by just separating the disjunction between two different types of ontology. I don't think... Mark posits them as positive and negative in a way I'm about to, but the idea of the hauntology is efficacy, the effectiveness of the virtual or the non-physical or the non-present. And this goes to Derrida, of course, this for the listeners of this goes to Derrida's deconstruction of the metaphysics of presence, which basically means that in metaphysics, when philosophy generally presence is being privileged over absence, and there's no reason for that, it's just a presupposition. So he's going to look on the other side and see where those presuppositions end up. And the idea of the efficacy of stuff that isn't there ends up in, of course, these two registers, which is the that which is not yet in existence, but its possibility still has an impact on the present. And that's like the specter of communism in Marx and Engels' Communist Manifesto, of course, and all the specters of, say, Chile or the Red Plenty of the Soviet Union, which never materialized. And, of course, we have the, the no longer aspect of hauntology, which Marx associates with the compulsion to repeat. It is no longer there something you can keep trying to repeat. And I think the no longer has more of an efficacy these days in terms of the phonological music in this negative sense, because, I mean, lo-fi hip-hop beats to relax slash till chill to. It's a relatively enhanced, quite sort of contemporary form of music, but you don't actually have to know who the artists are. You could just put on an endless loop of it for productivity, for studying, for working, for sleeping and relaxing. I think the flag is being held up in the negative sense, possibly by lo-fi hip-hop as a general sort of an, a counterpart to catalog the contemporary okay. isn't it's just it's generic it's um, you don't even have to be listening to it it's like a, the e-ipod from Marx capitalist realism and of course i love it I, I can see there's a particular smothering of the new day i haven't listened to a new record in quite a while at some at some point in my life because i've been tapping into this while i'm working <laughs> yeah that's interesting I mean, yeah i suppose it sort of sounds a bit like like this lo-fi hip hop is functioning in the way that vaporwave kind of gestures at in its ironic way. But this is actually the real void music, the real vapid music of now. Is it actually exactly to think about, or is it, is it having interesting musical qualities, or is it, or is it the absence of them that actually is interesting? <laughs> it's just nice. Just feel. It's just yeah, generically nice. Vaporwave at least has this disturbing thing of you slightly remember it, and then it's you know, contorting or it's 
or even Mall Wave, the idea that I did yeah. an album by a cat system called yeah. Pole Mall, which is the first track is 23 minutes of the sound of a mall with the music going on in the background. And it's, I've actually put it on in a mall, taking my earphones out, it sounds the same. But Whoa. the irony, I think, is completely lost in this instantaneousness. I'm not saying people shouldn't enjoy it. I enjoy it. But there's definitely a dimension to here in which there's something that's not happened. There's something that has failed to appear. Something, uh, there's a, sort of a weird or eerie about it. We'll do a weird and eerie episode at some point. That'll, that'll sort that out. But yeah, so it's, this is the haunting aspect of ontology, I guess. And I think keeping it in this idea of music, one of the most interesting and arguably quite controversial points in Ghosts of My Life is this this thought experiment he does, which yeah. Mark says that the thought experiment is basically put on any record from the past twenty to thirty years, and yeah. see if you get that sense of future shock that you would have gotten if you say put on say if you say put on some Brexia or something, or you put on yeah. Tomorrow Never Knows by the Beatles, or you put yeah. on Parliament Funkadelic or something like that, and yeah. it's his his wager. Mark's wager here is, is that you won't feel that kind of shock. He wouldn't budge so expect. But I know, Simon, you talk about in your afterword that there's an ambiguity of whether this, this whole experiment still has the same sort of grip as it did in the early 2010s or so to speak. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, I think there have definitely been some things that have happened in the 2010s that sort of, I think, would have been surprising if you took them back. Certainly the things that people were doing with auto-tune on the voice in rap, the kind that Kit Mac and Josh writes about it. Neon screams, rat words. It's just all about weird vocal texture and strange grunts and gasps and nonverbal ticks taken to the extreme by Playboy Carti, but there, Playboy Carti, yeah, and Future and uh, loads of other artists. I think if you took that back, people would certainly be maybe wouldn't be shocked because sometimes it's quite a sort of ambienty, pleasant sounds, but they would be surprised that this could be popular, maybe. And I think some of the hyperpop and the Sophie type music might be surprising. Just the sheer weird gloss of it and the sort of drama of the beats. So it's very hard to say. I mean, when Mark makes, that's a bit of a wager. So I'm making this wager that mm -hmm. things will, that there'll be no innovations that will disprove his, his, his sort of throw down there. And it reminds me a little bit of when I was writing Retromania, which was that I was finishing it and I was like, fuck, I hope no one comes up with something innovative. <laughs> yeah. Which was ridiculous because of course my deepest desire as a writer and a, someone who was obsessed with music was that something innovative and new would happen. But because I had just committed myself to write a book on the subject that innovation had slowed to a standstill, I had a vested interest now in, in nothing happened. Luckily at that point, nothing really starting did happen. And my thesis had some suasional traction at the point it hit the bookshelves, which was 2011. But, you know, you know, I think that's interesting that Mark did make, I, I wonder if he would have in the afterwards, I wonder if he would have allowed for the idea that this auto tune, vocal weirdness, hip hop, and some of the vocal weirdness kind of stuff you get also in, in the fringes of electronic music, like Holly Herndon and people like that. Yeah. I wonder whether he would have said, okay, I must modify my start slightly or whether he would say, no, my theory is correct. And under these conditions we live, there can't be new things. I mean, I think it's clear that, I think it's clear that there's something, it feels like something has gone strange with time and, and the way that things go back and get recycled endlessly. I mean, there's definitely things of this time that totally continue to substantiate the sort of argument of ghosts in my life. Like if you look at like hologram pop, I mean, hologram pop is like a case study of, yeah. of everything that Mark's talking about. I mean, it's literally technological ghosts. It's morbid, it's exploitative, it's grave robbing. It's, it makes you ethically, ontologically, aesthetically hologram pop is, <laughs> I'm talking particularly not ABBA going on tour with sending out surrogates themselves. That's something else I'm talking about dead people reanimated technologically. Yeah. You couldn't get more ontological than that, could you? It's like, it's the convergence of all these things, the archive, the techno uh, digital technology, the dead oppressing the living kind of thing, the sort of mausoleum culture, museum culture, mausoleum culture. It's all these things converge in one phenomenon, hologram pop. And I think there are other things like there was talk, I don't know if it ever came out, there was talk, they were going to have James Dean 
acting new films. They digitally reconstitute James Dean, his voice, his speech patterns, his gestures, and actually have him starring in a new film. So, I mean, I think if that hasn't happened yet, that is only years away from happening in Hollywood, where you have these undead actors, undead singers generating new. So I think there's still a lot of, I don't think it needs to be like, you don't have to be like, there's absolutely no innovation and nothing new to prove, to substantiate the arguments Mark's making. I think you can talk about a preponderance or a dominance of the retro and a creeping sort of uncanniness and ghostiness that pervades culture. It's all, but it's all tight. I think it's all, it is, it's what makes it in his book and in mine, we both try and say, why has this happened? And I think for me, the determinant is really the technology. It's something to do with digital technology and this uncanny ability to copy things exactly, reanimate things, go back through the archive instantly and recall things, I think, and to inundate yourself with the past as well, just the way that streaming and which neither of us really talk about because it hadn't really taken off when we were doing a books, but streaming is like the next level beyond reblogs and iTunes and uh, that kind of thing. Streaming is where these vast archives are just completely open to you and you can just get lost in this labyrinth of the past. And if that applies much to yeah, it, film as it does to music. The film, especially nowadays, the entirety of the film industry is about the sort of repackaging and imaginings that really bringing it's really bringing the dead back to it's putting tom cruise back in top gun has that that very specific quality and i think what's so interesting about what you both spoke about recently is that there is at the very least there's tons of cautionary tales in this idea of course but at the very least the sort of descriptive power that of that that runs counter to this sort of aggressive packaging and reimagining of a sort of closed loop past that the sort of countervailing descriptive power of a band that you talked about in the afterward, like the band Dry Cleaning, for example, I think about the line, just an emo dead stuff collector. And as in, in the same way that Retromania Goes to My Life, I think actually have opened up to Arch from before they were written up until our contemporary moment, I think about the mundane of the everyday, I think about the conversation between that line from dry cleaning, a line from someone like Courtney Barnett, who says, it's a Monday, it's so mundane. And mm. then the title of Mark's playlist, No More Miserable Monday Mornings, mm. which is this idea that like, no more, no more, to me, no more miserable Monday mornings represented that there, there is something to be seen from this cataloging of the everyday i'm a, kind of a benjaminian guy so it's i that's my 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 own bias he's showing but that perhaps there's some redemptive spirit in the sort of say the music of dry cleaning or something yeah. like that there are two sides of the fisherian kind of the morning it's the sleep and mods and the dry cleaning but sorry <laughs> <laughs> yes i thought that was interesting that that in his later writing mark started to write about the jam with the last band i ever thought he would like, and then he wrote about this great writing about Sleaford Mods. I think it was just one review he did for the while, but like it perfectly encapsulated what was interesting, exciting about them and, and bleak as well. Yeah. And uh, so there seemed to be an interest in a kind of realism, a kind of just look at the shitness of everything and shove your, shove the listeners or the reader's face right in it. But then that's never enough in itself. You need to have like a. Right. critique, you need to have a positive vision, you need to have some kind of alternative that you're dreaming up, which I guess, I guess Paul Weller did. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's interesting to wonder what Bart would have found exciting now. He would have, there was bound to be something that would have, at least one thing every year, I would have thought he would have ra rallied around or come up with some, used it as some kind of launch pad for a set of ideas. I speculate in this afterward that it might have been dry cleaning, but that's me just really imposing my uh, mm -hmm. own taste, intruding my own taste in there a bit. But I mean, what do you think? What do you think might the book? Because Ghost of Mice, although it covers TV and I think there's film in there and there's writers, it's Sybil in there. There's it's quite a lot of non music. It is, I suppose, not 70% of music collection there. It's like that. Yes. 
roughly 70% of the contents is music journalism. So I do, I do wonder, as well as the sort of larger wondering of what, how Mark would have developed his ideas with asymptomism and, and what else he would have said politically, I do also just wonder, like, what would you have found redeeming or even just interesting about music in the, in this sort of, is it five years now, six years since you, you died? Years. Any, any thoughts? What do you think you might have been excited by? Have we- if I go first, I'm a little bit biased because I wrote an essay about using Marx's post-capitalist desire, like because I had to read Sleaford Mod's song "Job Seeker." But I do think <laughs> it is very. I do think it is very much Sleaford Mods because they, they have that. They have an alternative, but I think they have the idea of a, a standpoint, like a very particular position, uh, the position of the job seeker, which begins with these numbers, which is I found out was to do with like roast chickens cooking in the back of an Asda or something, and it's completely it makes completely no sense, but. And like the raw particularity of, I've been given, like, you know, so, uh, someone asked me, what have you done since your last job seekers appointment? I said, fuck all. And that's like mass rejection is also a kind of rejection of all desires that the job center is trying to inculcate into them. It's a rejection Whoa. of the, the given. And it very much fits into Lukács and uh, how he uses Lukács and Hartsock's idea of just the standpoint where you want something new. And this is why I think there's, 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 a, there's a good, there's almost a transfiguration of Marx's sort of outlook between Ghost of My Life and Capitalist Realism and Acid Communism, because the stasis aspect of culture, I mean, at least so far as I read it, is taken back in a way to its original meaning of the word stasis, which is the Greek word for civil war. It's mm-hmm. kind of like the idea that rather than this pervasive atmosphere has won, and we're all sitting here going, oh shit, is something going to come from the outside? It's very landy, a CCRU kind of position. It always seems like when he turns back to the 70s, exactly, he said the jam. I mean, the, the jam and also the hippie movements. Like, this is a break from the goth Mark Fisher <laughs> that um, mm. he's so much used to. The cold, the Spinozism of cold rationalism, I think he mm. spoke about at one point. And it, it seems like he's turning back to, oh, wait, no, this was a civil war that we no, didn't totally lose. We just, mm. it's more of a, a, a it's, got, it's gotten a bit colder. But culture is still an active place of civil struggle. It's where I can go back to the hippies and say, look, they completely cocks up. They all became bunch of new liberals. But that was a coercion of an existing emancipatory force. This is why you know, he goes back to you know, Sly and the Family Stone, Tomorrow Never Knows. And I think towards his, his later period of writing, I think he does take the stasis as kind of, if something killed all of these potentials must have been dangerous enough to be killable or to be something that they would have put all their effort into stamping down upon the global south, upon yeah. hippie movement, upon metaphors in America. I try to read Mark Fisher's books now with a kind of a kind of sense of this isn't as relevant as it used to be because people think they might as well, they still want to, I think there's a movement, Lisa, people want to tell the present state of things to at least not, you may not have a program in your hand, but you know that something needs to fuck off and you can find some music yeah. to help you do that. Even if it's idols, who I think are a bit too sloganeering for the, the sort of the particularities of it, or sleeved mods or dry cleaning. I think there are some sort of lines of flight to use a typically Deleuzean term there. <laughs> but uh, oh. well, sorry. <laughs> No, I think that's I think that's true. I don't have a particular sort of as historians as we're trained to do, you you lean into the non particularity, right? Unless you really want to double down on whatever your particular take would be. But I, something that I found so interesting about contemporary music and that I think of in this I actually think really kind and generous way that we keep bringing Ghost of My Life back allow it to haunt to allow it to persist spectrally, if you will, is at the very least thinking about what would what would his particular interest be. But I'm I just more than anything I'm curious what his thoughts on the sort of high fi psychedelia of someone like Playboy Cardi, how it relates to popularity, and especially how I think a lot about the YouTube channel of a guy, his name he has a YouTube channel called J Money Ten Four One he directs a lot of music videos but what he became popular for were group dancing videos which are mostly it's usually young teenagers black teenagers doing basically engaging in like a dance circle you know we've come a long way from battling and things like that but they instead have this sort of i find those videos to be very celebratory not just of the music which is very true they clearly love and listen to the music that they're sharing with everybody and it's not always music. It's music that mixes underground hip hop with 
much more mainstream hip hop. And then Chance the Rapper shows up in the video sometimes. But it has this like this interplay of personal and depersonal. It's a video that you're watching, but at the same time, you have sense that like, at least in, in that particular moment, some sort of spatial awareness was achieved through spontaneity, joy, celebration, qualities that we don't have a lot of in our contemporary moment. So I thought, it, I guess more than anything, and what I've been inspired by reading Mark's work in the collection, as well as your introduction to the K-Punk collection, Simon, as well, your forward, as well as your afterward for this, is that it was always about moving beyond the diagnosis of our particular, of the particular moment and trying to like, okay, the, there we've diagnosed the necessary imperative to imagine a better future. Now, what is, what are the sort of essences of that better future that are appearing in our contemporary moment? And it always just kind of felt like stuff that felt like it was either creating, building a spatial awareness among people or institutionalizing a particular feeling or moment that I think would be meaningful and impactful. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, it sounds a bit like when you're describing these videos, which I haven't seen, is a bit like, yeah, almost like the spirit of Sly Stone dance for music in the present. I thought it was one record I thought was really amazing. It's a, a, not recent, but it's like, I don't know, four years ago, was was the Black Beatles by Ray Shremard. Oh, Ray Shremard. Yeah. And I thought yeah. it was because because in Latin communism, surprisingly, Mark refer, references the Beatles, and he mis references psychedelic era. Psychedelic soul of the t temptations, I think, and Sly and the Family Stone, all those things. But uh, I just thought it was really interesting that uh, there would be this persistence. Like, I imagine Ray Sherman have only a faintest idea of what the Beatles were and what they represented. But somehow they, they, that still signifies as this sort of idea of, well, there's a bunch of ideas. There's all these ideas of the ultimate in fame and freedom and creativity that the Beatles represented, but also the Beatles were like a particular instantation of a, uh, of a general idea in the sixties, which is the band, I know the band is this collectivity or a kind of quasi family, a, ch a family you chose and created mm -hmm. and like a little micro utopia. And so for some bands, Beatles above all, they exist in this space where work is play and play is work. There's no, there's no difference between the two there. They are paid to play. And I think that idea of the Beatles as representing some kind of supreme existence of fun, togetherness, purpose, and aesthetic expression. I thought it was interesting it's resurfaced in this most unlikely context of hip hop and, and in this wonderful song, it's very carefree. I mean, it is ironic also that I also did a song called Up Like Trump. This is before Trump yeah. <laughs> was the candidate, but you know, Trump on this, in that song also represented like a supreme kind of lifestyle of being the boss and being, being this moneyed guy. In, in Black Beatles, they have a line where they say something like, young man living like an old geezer. So that's almost like an echo of the song, yeah. up like Trump. <laughs> anyway, I'm rambling a bit, but I, I think it's interesting that these echoes of the joy and the freedom and the purposeful energy that pop has had in the past still exists today in these videos that you're talking about, the dance videos. Are they, are, do people dance together simultaneously or is it like people that turn to do a spotlight? It's both. And that's what's so oh. special about it. At, sometimes you'll see people will like, two yeah. young people will dance at the same time. And then always, it's usually the trade off stuff. Sometimes they'll tap someone in. Sometimes someone will just come in at a, it's everything. It's, and it's that thing of like, yeah, a collective con Co a collectivity in which you can also be an individual and be exceptional yes. or unique, but within this, thing, which I think of yeah. all things that have a snap, uh, um, a whiff of utopia about, I mean, there's probably a slight exaggeration to say the blogging scene was utopian, but it did have something about it where everyone was collected, but we were also flexing our individual flair. And there's a little bit of competition as well as the collectivity. And that to me is. When I associate the sort of happiest times of my life, it's when I've been in a context where I've been part of a team of people doing something that felt purposeful. And I'm working in a music paper, I'm doing a fanzine in the eighties, later this, the blogging scene where I, I felt like I wasn't just on my own working for myself. That was contributing to something that was a larger web of something. And that, but also I could be myself, I could be 
individual and obsessive and whatever. So these little videos you're describing sound like little mini utopias of uh, collective aesthetic expression and fun. Yeah, so it's a... Uh... Even though I have not seen it, I can sense what you might find inspiring about them. It's an exciting sort of unity with the present, which I think the your comment about Ray Schremert is perfect for that. Sort of the like the ability to, despite I mean, you know, I've seen you talk about it before. Hip hop's very intimate relationship with capitalism and its use of the language and the framework of capitalism. I think about this. I think about this too when Juice World, where we used to refer to himself as Codeine Cobain. I believe that was. I believe that was Juice. All right. World, which I thought was. It turned out to be a very tragic sort of story, but I thought yeah. very at, at least very powerful evoking of the past for some kind because the, the hip hop scene could be really into the first Nirvana record in particular, but I think it's so much bigger than that. And that's what's, I think that's, what's good about your writing and what about Mark's writing, which is that it's not interested in trying to immediately use, it's not interested in using history as this sort of cudgel for placing music in its particular time, place, category and expression, but yeah. rather exploring how we might, just as you were describing with the blogging scene or these videos or whatever, how we might in small ways disintegrate and reintegrate um, as this active living, breathing process. I don't know. I kind of just wanted to bring up just as a, on a lighter note. So a while back for Asset Horizon, about a year or so back, we had French Joe McElhoon and Natasha Eves on who both run the four K-Punk nights on top of the, the Mark Fisher Memorial Lecture, of course, you gave in 2020. Was that right? Yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. They... <laughs> and I was very aware of the weightiness of the occasion. But I, yeah, I actually played some of this, some of the music that, that we've been touching on, like, like Slime of Henry Stone and things like that. I don't know. If it, I, I just, well, it was led, that, led to it because of Asp Communism, the intro to the unfinished book. But also, I, I think I was unconsciously, although it's meant to be a glum. So anyway, I thought, well, let's have some joy in it because as troubled as he was, he could be a very joyful person. I always, I remember him laughing a lot and, uh, I think he could be very funny as well as the contents of this book show and he's attacking things. It's very funny. And uh, it's a bit like when someone says, for God's sake, don't play sad music at my funeral kind of thing. I felt like, yeah, let's play some close then. The first club night they put on, the 4K punk night, I think that was when they just played nothing but Kanye West, The Life of Pablo on loop <laughs> the entire evening. And they also, Natasha knitted some scarves that provided an answer to one of our previous questions. And then they said on them, Mark Fisher would have loved Cardi B. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we can do a full exhibition of Cardi B on that, but I mean, I, I do think those spaces are important because particularly because they are spaces. I mean, thinking about goes of my life is a big book about time in many ways. The spatial element is, of course, there, but the spatial element is itself haunting the book. This is why I think it's so good to return to it again and dig into it and find these kinds of remnants of space and not just place in general. Non, I know, very much place, actually, because the idea of a non-place, of being stuck mm. in transit, is something that's hard to grasp, particularly if you're always kept moving by neoliberal capitalism and precarity. And I always like the idea that there's not a Mark Fisher Memorial Hall in Goldsmiths, but when that, but when it comes around, that building is the Mark Fisher Memorial University because you have, there are outflow rooms. There's like four or five different outflow rooms. The thing is packed. You haven't got a name. It's a space that's made into that space through occupation. This is why I would like so much about how Mark and Kojo Eshin talk about jungle, how, but it, it libidinalizes anxiety. A kind of there's an element of transgression there. Of course, it didn't repeat out that way, but there's an element of you know, enjoying anxiety not only if it's Terminator by 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 Ruffage Crew and you're being chased by this giant cybernetic entity or, or Cylon or something like that, but it's instead the idea that you can enjoy the anxiety that this your situation thrusts you into, particularly this urban, very much heavily policed aspect of the modern cybernetic capitalist landscape. I just want to ask a question about particularly. I just want to ask a question about jungle, really. I mean, I'm a jungle producer myself. I don't, and I look more like a black metal musician. I used to be one, but that's not the point. Because this is, it's one of the main influences in this work, but it's kind of a bit disjunctive in terms of the music he's, uh, Mark Fish is thinking about here. You have a lot of stuff about the lost futures aspect of Joy Division, the crackle of Caretaker. But really, jungle is 
something that's very much underrated within this book and very much within the wider blogger scene, of course. I mean, we had Repeater put out Gungalist, the yeah. actual book, which has yeah. been missing in so many different spaces for years. And you pick it up and I'm like, oh shit, this is what Mark was thinking about. Yeah, it's why I like Terminator. It's like a transformer whacking his head against the fucking wall to put the, the full quote out there. But also a bit about the affect and the theoretical importance of jungle, both in the sort of your work and also as how you see it as working in Mark's work. Well, I think Mark and I had quite different, although we loved jungle music and drum and bass with the same kind of intensity, we had a kind of different take on it in a way. Like I always felt that Mark was much more about the records. And whereas for me, it was much more about pirate radio. I mean, I love the records, obviously, and went out and bought them and... Well, but the pirate radio and the actual going to the jungle events itself was a much bigger thing. Like I'm much more about the social spaces the jungle created, including the sort of, I guess, virtual social spaces, the radio broadcasting its audience and the massive out there phoning in with their requests and getting shouts from the MCs. Whereas I think for Mark, it's much more the imaginative spaces that listening to Ruffage Crew or for Hero or other artists like that, created in his mind. So, but yeah, I think that in our slightly different inflected ways, I mean, both of us hugely invested. Jungle is the music of the 90s. And and in fact, on in Degeneration, the group that Mark was involved in, they referenced Jungle in their press release. And it's, they don't make, they're not making Jungle music. What they made was a bit more like actually trip hop in a way, like mid-tempo. Sure, yeah. Groove music with writing sounds and very loaded samples, like a sample of Johnny Rotten saying, ever get the feeling you've been cheated? And it's a bit more like, I don't know, not exactly Porter's head, but somewhere between trip hop and what ontology would actually be in the big groups like Three Poly or things like that, or modern music. But yeah, Jungle, Jungle is something that, that they were aware of as Degeneration were aware of as this upsurge of, yeah innovation of this sort of speed energy was a big part of it. It's kind of amphetamine energy that sort of yeah. brought in some ways brought back the spirit of mod, but in actual completely new music, <laughs> sort of living for the weekend, burning through, uh, burning through your energy stoked by these pills it was very, I think this important to Mark as well, but particularly to me, the racial politics of jungle was just like, so unbelievably interesting, exciting, seemed to prophesy something better sort of future Britain. But I think the main thing about it is that it, it jungle and that whole culture, techno as well at that time, GABA, all those things seem to be the musical flesh, as it were, to these concepts that would later be called accelerationism. And it was because everything was accelerating. The music was accelerating. The metabolisms of the audiences were accelerated on these ecstasy and amphetamines and other stuff. And there was a real just sort of sense of you were hurtling towards something. I, I used the, the a couple of times in writing about jungle, not at the time, but retrospectively, I taught, use this word teleology, just to sort of this feeling there was that kind of, it was going somewhere. It was a kind of destiny or something or destination that everything was hurting towards. So that, I think that was the main thing is like, especially it also, it did, it was occurring in the middle of a context of a lot of backward looking music and. Britpop, sort of retro culture in a way. And then there was an eruption of something that was absolutely forward looking, absolutely propulsive, absolutely electrifying me now. And it was very much like, yeah, the future shock. Yeah, it was the future shock against which Mark would then later come up with his concept of jungle as a proof that this was a music that if you took it back to even 10 years earlier, certainly 20 years earlier, people would be totally befuddled by it and disoriented by it and scrambled by it and not able to understand how it could be danced to or enjoyed as music. People at the time, I had people who went to dance music, colleagues of mine, who actually said to me, jungle's not music. It's just funny because you look, listen back to it and you hear all the musicality and then you hear things that yeah. actually relate to jazz and to all, all kinds yeah. of things, but it was so befuddling, the onslaught of it, particularly the dark side stuff, oh, I think boy. that sort of slightly cruder phase with the nasty sounds and the creepy effects and the, 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 the really chilling samples, like this will be the day that you die, sampled from Don McLean, American Pie, sped up into this slimy goblin voice. This will be the day that you die. It occurring 
played in a rave where people are taking pills is com- compositionally I'm not sure of. <laughs> yeah. There have been headlines about people dying on the dance floor. Anyway. So anyway, yeah, uh, I did have colleagues, dance floor aficionados, fans of house techno who would say, jungle's just not music. Yeah, that was a long answer. Did you get me on the subject of jungle? Uh, I get going. It's actually like my mental me- metabolism accelerates again. No, same here. I discovered it far too, it was before my time, but it, it was haunting me as an industrial musician for years and years until I think, until I feel how to do it. And then, so, so but, but Jungle, uh, Amen Breaks may have overtaken Last Beats, but I know we've already gone over the hour, so. Was it the, the mascot music or the musical soundtrack to the CCRU, isn't it? It's for them, yeah. their charismatic proof in a way of their theories, but also like their emotional climate the sonic emotional climate in which they are hatching all their theories as well. Yeah, they had the Swarm Machines performance, which I think you can yeah. listen to up on Urbanomics website listeners. There is, I think, or Urbanomics SoundCloud, there's performance of Swarm Machines at a club. I Don't ask me where it's all, no, but it's, I think it's Mark, Sadie Plants, and He Who Shall Not Be Named, reading out various texts of the Delurzo Guitarian Symphonies. And it is, I mean, Going to a thousand plateaus and you have rhythm versus meter and the idea of getting lost in those kinds of flows of bass. And it's, I, mean, I have to, I, I tried writing Hegelian jungle. You've got to use the lures for that kind of thing. You can't, <laughs> there is no such thing as Hegelian jungle. I've tried it. It's failed, but Hegel, you've got to use, you've got to take into black metal. Like, I, I, guess. <laughs> I mean, okay. I'm not going to plug any of my own material here. This is going to be, this is book, this is book time. Uh, well, let's, uh, it's named after a jungle drink, isn't it? It's named after... Rough. Yeah. But the one that has its own little Mark Ghost in it, because it has the sample from David Sylvian. Mm. Um, ghosts and, you know, it's, it's the perfect title from the book. It's the least anxiety-ridden Ruffy Through song in some way, because you're not being chased, you're not being chased by something that's supposed to be there. And I think that's, it's the more, it's most haunting, not being the most oh. dangerous feeling. And that's why I think it has such a lasting impact. Particularly with just the yeah, the Japan song, which is, I mean, I've heard it for the first time a couple of days ago. Did you? You have to you have to hear it and see it. You have to see the performance on top of the box, David Silly, uh, which is uh, to get the full effect because it was so shocking. That just the silence that he was able to bring into the context of the top of the box. So typically, the studio has balloons in it and people dancing, and then suddenly everything. There is this incredible standstill poise of David Sylvian, this song without a beat, I think, and, and this incredible hush that he brings into this mm. main party atmosphere of, <laughs> of Top of the Pops. 14 then or something when you saw that, or 13, that would be the kind of thing that would scar you. Yeah. <laughs> In a good way, like add yeah. a sort of peak, a peak intervention into pop music that brings something strange into it okay well you can see david sylvian on the cover uh, the other it's really well to work it out and then we've got sapphire and steel curtis yeah. and someone's hand i cannot work out maybe it's in curtis's hand it is it's got a microphone but yeah we've got some it's got a great new cover simon thank you so much for coming on to zero works archive Pleasure. do you have anything you'd want to apart from this book of course anything you're working on right now anything you'd like to plug not really no unless if you have any French viewers, there is a book coming out in France that is like a collection of all my, or not all my, a lot of my writing on the hardcore continuum is coming out. It's called hardcore because, because in French, <laughs> I remember I just thought that like in French, you say hardcore, it comes out as hardcore, which is how I used to spell hardcore in energy flash without the H because that's, it's, it's scrawled on in record stores, this sort of demotic misspelling, mis- mispronunciation of it. Yeah, so, yeah, if anyone in France is watching, that's coming out on the editions Audimat. One last but, question. What are you listening to recently? What's your late, what's the latest recommendations? If- oh God, <laughs> I always go blank. I have actually been listening to the new dry cleaning album, which is very good and is different, actually, from the previous one. And I don't know, I just spend a lot of time listening to things from the past. So I've been listening to a lot of jazz and uh, soul music, actually, partly because it relates to this course I'm teaching at Cal. I don't know what, I don't, it's not much that's really crappy, I must admit, this year. Mm. I mean, I did like the burial album, but it feels not lame for burial, but lame for me to sort of say, that's 
one of my favorite arms of the year, just because it seems a predictably sort of thing to do. But it was really good, I thought. Oh, what about you guys? See, now I'm going play. And that's not fair. No, I've been like, I don't know anyone else. Oh, like, like, I have actually, I did start writing down. <laughs> Oh, you remind me of smart idea. Right down. Sorry, no, I, I should have said the questions in advance. So I didn't mean to spend uh, the, <laughs> chat, the new chat pile record. Right. That's a good record. I like that. Yeah, the thing on that. Fisher Continuum, Ash Inspire's new album, Hostile Architecture, Avant Garde oh, sure. Metal from Scotland, explicitly and mainly about capitalist realism. They do this avant garde black metal thing, but with more of a kind of a shouty, sleeved, modsy, most punky kind of vocal, very much up the sort of the vein of. I guess not intelligent black metal sounds kind of condescending, but then again, black metal could be a very stupid genre. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it's that's something I'll just throw out there. <laughs> but regardless, so thank you so much for coming on to Zero Books Archive. It's been great talking oh, to you. It's been great. Thanks. Good chatting with you guys. We appreciate your support of the imprint and the channel. Subscribe to Zero Books today on Patreon. Your material support helps us to promote a variety of perspectives on the left. Also, discover the many titles, new and old, that Zero has curated. Navigate to any of the links in the show notes to extend your support.